Book Four, Part Three of Plato's Republic. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by B. G. Oxford. The Republic by Plato, translated by Benjamin Jowett. Book Four, Part Three. The time then has arrived, Glaucon, when, like huntsmen, we should surround the cover, and look sharp that justice does not steal away, and pass out of sight and escape us, for beyond a doubt she is somewhere in this country. Watch, therefore, and strive to catch a sight of her, and if you see her first, let me know. Would that I could, but you should regard me rather as a follower, who has just eyes enough to see what you show him that is about as much as i am good for offer up a prayer with me and follow i will but you must show me the way there is no path i said and the wood is dark and perplexing still we must push on let us push on here i saw something hallo i said i began to perceive a track and i believe that the quarry will not escape good news he said Truly, I said, we are stupid fellows. Why so? Why, my good sir, at the beginning of our inquiry, ages ago, there was justice tumbling out at our feet, and we never saw her. Nothing could be more ridiculous, like people who go about looking for what they have in their hands. That was the way with us. We looked not at what we were seeking, but at what was far off in the distance and therefore i suppose we missed her what do you mean i mean to say that in reality for a long time past we have been talking of justice and have failed to recognize her i grow impatient at the length of your exordium well then tell me i said whether i am right or not you remember the original principle which we were always laying down at the foundation of the state that one man should practice one thing only the thing to which his nature was best adapted now justice is this principle or part of it yes we often said that one man should do one thing only further we affirm that justice was doing one's own business and not being a busybody we said so again and again and many others have said the same to us yes we said so then to do one's own business in a certain way may be assumed to be justice can you tell me whence i derive this inference i cannot but i should like to be told because i think that this is the only virtue which remains in the state when the other virtues of temperance and courage and wisdom are abstracted and that this is the ultimate cause and condition of the existence of all of them and while remaining in them is also their preservative and we were saying that if the three were discovered by us justice would be the fourth or remaining one that follows of necessity if we are asked to determine which of these four qualities by its presence contributes most to the excellence of the state whether the agreement of rulers and subjects or the preservation in the soldiers of the opinion which the law ordains about the true nature of dangers or wisdom and watchfulness in the rulers or whether this other which i am mentioning and which is found in children and women slave and freeman artisan ruler subject the quality i mean of every one doing his own work and not being a busybody would claim the palm the question is not so easily answered certainly he replied there would be a difficulty in saying which then the power of each individual in the state to do his own work appears to compete with the other political virtues wisdom temperance courage yes he said and the virtue which enters into this competition is justice exactly let us look at the question from another point of view are not the rulers in a state those to whom you would entrust the office of determining suits at law certainly 
and are suits decided on any other ground but that a man may neither take what is another's nor be deprived of what is his own yes that is their principle which is a just principle yes then on this view also justice will be admitted to be the having and doing what is a man's own and belongs to him very true think now and say whether you agree with me or not suppose a carpenter to be doing the business of a cobbler or a cobbler of a carpenter and suppose them to exchange their implements or their duties or the same person to be doing the work of both or whatever be the change do you think that any great harm would result to the state not much but when the cobbler or any other man whom nature designed to be a trader having his heart lifted up by wealth or strength or the number of his followers or any like advantage attempts to force his way into the class of warriors or a warrior into that of legislators and guardians for which he is unfitted and either to take the implements or the duties of the other or when one man is traitor legislator and warrior all in one then i think you will agree with me in saying that this interchange and this meddling of one with another is the ruin of the state most true seeing then i said that there are three distinct classes any meddling of one with the other or the change of one to another is the greatest harm to the state and may be most justly termed evil doing precisely and the greatest degree of evil doing to one's own city would be termed by you injustice certainly this then is injustice and on the other hand when the trader the auxiliary and the guardian each do their own business that is justice and will make the city just i agree with you we will not i said be over positive as yet but if on trial this conception of justice be verified in the individual as well as in the state there will be no longer any room for doubt if it be not verified we must have a fresh inquiry first let us complete the old investigation which we began as you remember under the impression that if we could previously examine justice on the larger scale there would be less difficulty in discerning her in the individual that larger example appeared to be the state and accordingly we constructed as good a one as we could knowing well that in the good state justice would be found let the discovery which we made be now applied to the individual if they agree we shall be satisfied or if there be a difference in the individual we will come back to the state and have another trial of the theory the friction of the two when rubbed together may possibly strike a light in which justice will shine forth and the vision which is then revealed we will fix in our souls that will be in regular course let us do as you say i proceeded to ask when two things a greater and less are called by the same name are they like or unlike in so far as they are called the same like he replied the just man then if we regard the idea of justice only will be like the just state he will and the state was thought by us to be just when the three classes in the state severally did their own business and also thought to be temperate and valiant and wise by reason of certain other affections and qualities of these same classes true he said and so of the individual we may assume that he has the same three principles in his own soul which are found in the state and he may be rightly described in the same terms because he is affected in the same manner certainly he said once more then o oh my friend we have alighted upon an easy question whether the soul has these three principles or not an easy question nay rather socrates the proverb holds that hard is the good very true i said and i do not think that the method which we are employing is at all adequate to the accurate solution of this question the true method is another and a longer one still we may arrive at a solution not below the level of the previous inquiry 
"'May we not be satisfied with that?' he said. "'Under the circumstance, I am quite content.' I, too, I replied, shall be extremely well satisfied. Then faint not in pursuing the speculation, he said. Must we not acknowledge, I said, that in each of us there are the same principles and habits which there are in the state, and that from the individual they pass into the state? How else can they come there? Take the quality of passion or spirit. It would be ridiculous to imagine that this quality when found in states, is not derived from the individuals who are supposed to possess it. For example, the Thracians, Scythians, and in general, the northern nations. And the same may be said of the love of knowledge, which is the special characteristic of our part of the world, or of the love of money, which may with equal truth be attributed to the Phoenicians and Egyptians. Exactly so, he said. There is no difficulty in understanding this, none whatever. But the question is not quite so easy when we proceed to ask whether these principles are three or one, whether, that is to say, we learn with one part of our nature, are angry with another, and with a third part desire the satisfaction of our natural appetites, or whether the whole soul comes into play in each sort of action, to determine that is the difficulty. Yes, he said, there lies the difficulty. Then let us now try and determine whether they are the same or different. How can we? he asked. I replied as follows. The same thing clearly cannot act or be acted upon in the same part or in relation to the same thing at the same time in contrary ways, and therefore Whenever this contradiction occurs in things apparently the same, we know that they are really not the same, but different. Good. For example, I said, can the same thing be at rest and in motion at the same time in the same part? Impossible. Still, I said, let us have a more precise statement of terms, lest we should hereafter fall out by the way. Imagine the case of a man who is standing, and also moving his hands and his head, and suppose a person to say that one and the same person is in motion, and at rest at the same moment. To such a mode of speech we should object, and should rather say that one part of him is in motion, while another is at rest. Very true. And suppose the objector to refine still further, and to draw the nice distinction that not only parts of tops, but whole tops, when they spin around with their pegs fixed on the spot, are at rest and in motion at the same time, and he may say, the same of anything which revolves in the same spot. His objection would not be admitted by us, because in such cases things are not at rest and in motion in the same parts of themselves. We should rather say that they have both an axis and a circumference, and that the axis stands still, for there is no deviation from the perpendicular, and that the circumference goes round. But if, while revolving, the axis inclines either to the right or left, forwards or backwards, then in no point of view can they be at rest. That is the correct mode of describing them, he replied then none of these objections will confuse us, or incline us to believe that the same thing, at the same time, in the same part, or in relation to the same thing, can act or be acted upon in contrary ways. Certainly not, according to my way of thinking. Yet, I said, that we may not be compelled to examine all such objections, and prove at length that they are untrue, let us assume their absurdity, and go forward on the understanding that hereafter, if this assumption turn out to be untrue, all the consequences which follow shall be withdrawn. Yes, he said, that will be the best way. Well, I said, would you not allow that assent and dissent, desire and aversion, attraction and repulsion, are all of them opposites? whether they are regarded as active or passive, for that makes no difference in the fact of their opposition. Yes, he said, they are opposites. Well, I said, 
and hunger and thirst, and the desires in general, and again willing and wishing, all these you would refer to the classes already mentioned. You would say, would you not, that the soul of him who desires is seeking after the object of his desire, or that he is drawing to himself the thing which he wishes to possess. Or again, when a person wants anything to be given him, his mind, longing for the realization of his desire, intimates his wish to have it by a nod of assent, as if he had been asked a question. Very true. And what would you say of unwillingness and dislike, and the absence of desire? Should not these be referred to the opposite class of repulsion and rejection? Certainly. Admitting this to be true of desire generally, let us suppose a particular class of desires, and out of these we will select hunger and thirst, as they are termed, which are the most obvious of them. Let us take that class, he said. The object of one is food, and of the other drink? Yes. And here comes the point. Is not thirst the desire which the soul has of drink, and of drink only? not of drink qualified by anything else, for example, warm or cold, or much or little, or, in a word, drink of any particular sort, but if the thirst be accompanied by heat, then the desire is of cold drink, or, if accompanied by cold, then of warm drink, or, if the thirst be excessive, then the drink, which is desired, will be excessive or if not great, the quantity of drink will also be small. But thirst pure and simple will desire drink pure and simple, which is the natural satisfaction of thirst, as food is of hunger. Yes, he said, the simple desire is, as you say, in every case of the simple object, and the qualified desire of the qualified object. But here a confusion may arise and I should wish to guard against an opponent starting up and saying that no man desires drink only, but good drink, or food only, but good food, for good is the universal object of desire, and thirst being a desire will necessarily be thirst after good drink, and the same is true of every other desire. Yes, he replied, the opponent might have something to say. Nevertheless, I should still maintain that of relatives some have a quality attached to either term of the relation. Others are simple, and have their correlatives simple. I do not know what you mean. Well, you know, of course, that the greater is relative to the less? Certainly. And the much greater to the much less? Yes. And the sometime greater to the sometime less? And the greater that is to be to the less that is to be? certainly he said and so of more and less and of other correlative terms such as the double and the half or again the heavier and the lighter the swifter and the slower and of hot and cold and of any other relatives is not this true of them all yes and does not the same principle hold in the sciences the object of science is knowledge assuming that to be the true definition, but the object of a particular science is a particular kind of knowledge. I mean, for example, that the science of house-building is a kind of knowledge, which is defined and distinguished from other kinds, and is therefore termed architecture. Certainly. Because it has a particular quality which no other has? Yes. And it has this particular quality because it has an object of a particular kind. And this is true of the other arts and sciences? Yes. End of Book 4, Part 3 Recorded by B.G. Oxford